is my partner Robert. Robert. Karen, this is Robert. We're my neighbors. How are y'all doing? How are you going? I think between the two of you. No, we drove. And we drove down to go. Is that the reason? Well, that's the only problem I'm going get right now. Okay. Yeah. Are you familiar with any of these? You know, you can be in solidarity without buying into it. <laughs> yeah. Just sort of looking at these uh, names across the decades, so to speak. Yeah. Website, right? United Against the Police. There's a website with the uh, murders, all the murders and killings uh, by the police throughout the country. Actually, by okay. okay. So it's an actual. Yeah. 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 So we'll go and try and find the organizer. Yeah, I'm assuming they'll come on. What is it? Oh my gosh, that's where she does that all the time. Hey, I'm hoping. You guys should have a little bit here. Hey, what's going on? Good. Did you take it? I got it. I got it too. I'll, I'll tag you in them, alright, Kathy? Yay, thank you, Paul. How are you doing? Good. Good. We just got it. Yeah, so you have that. Uh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, look like For coming out. One of the things that uh, we have to recognize is that we can't keep coming to, to rallies after the fact. We have to start planning to actually make a dent in this. This situation, we have to start planning. Uh, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to get people involved and to start making an effort to get some real change. And the kind of real change, or the one of the ways that we can get real change, is to have a, a true a genuine citizens review board see we have a citizens review board in the city but it doesn't work it, it, it's actually uh, it's really a police board because the police sat on the board and they intimidate witnesses and I'm sorry they intimidate board members into siding with the police all the time since the since the board has been in, in place since 1993 not one officer has been brought up on any charges. So, when the when the board was created, it was created after. So who remembers Sagan Pen? Anybody remember Sagan Pen? Oh, that's sad. Nobody knows when I mean, there's only a few people. Well, what happened was, well, I want to get into that story. But as a result of the Sagan Pen case, there was a call for a citizens review board, and the the. the uh, the, the citizens of Southeast San Diego were the main ones calling for it. That's the black area, in case nobody doesn't know. So they were calling for this board. And what happened was the police got their own board. They set up their own thing. And so there were two propositions. One, the one that won out was the one that the police put together. So what we need to do is we need to go back and put one for the people. So that we elect the people who are actually sitting on the board. So it begins to reflect the faces that we see out here today and not the police. Another way that we can do it is by cop watching. How many ever heard of cop watch? Cop watch is an organi organization that goes around uh, monitoring the police, police activities. So we have a, we have a chapter here called the Sagan Pen chapter of cop watch. 
and we meet every second Sunday, every second and fourth Sunday of the of the month. So we're asking for people to come out. If you're ready to be a part of the change that needs to happen, to come out to one of these meetings, and we meet right here in the park, right here at the, one of these tables, to come out and actually be part of the change. I, I challenge you to come up with another way to change the way things are going. I challenge you to come out and be a part of the change. And I want to say this finally. This is, this is a rally about Michael Brown. This is a rally about Michael Brown and all of the vi victims of police brutality. Because we have a whole list of people right over here. From San Diego just alone. So all these people are crying out for the help from the community now and saying, come out, do something, be a part of an organization. If you don't, if you don't see an organization that you want to be a part of, you make one, but be a part of the change. Thank you very much. Okay, my name is Gloria Verdu, and I'm with the Committee Against Police Brutality, and also with People's Power Assembly, and I'm also with the Coalition to Free Momia and All Political Prisoners. You know, there's a connection between the prison industrial complex and what we're doing here, and I don't think that anybody here has a problem with making that connection. And people who are in prisons, political prisoners, they are affected by what happens out here. But mainly, Momia writes about what happens out here. And so I'm gonna read a statement by Momia Abu-Jamal. But first I want to say, I want to agree with what Carl said, and that's true. You need to be a part of an organization. What we do as individuals is good, but we need to be a part of an organization. Let me tell you a story. And this story, everybody knows about. The story of the bus strike. Momia, I mean, uh, <laughs> Rosa Parks. Is everybody familiar with Rosa Parks and the 1955 bus strike? Does anybody know what the demands were of that bus strike? What were the initial de demands? Does anybody know? Well, let me see. It was three initial demands. One of the demands was that the bus drivers and the bus company treat the people with dignity. You know, when you walk on the bus, a black African person walking the bus, they'd have to and pay their dime, they'd have to walk off the bus and go to the back of the bus and get back on again. So be treated with dignity. And, and number two was that black people have a spot in the back of the bus is theirs. So that when the bus gets full, we don't have to give up and give up our seats like Rosa Parks had to do. That was number two. It seems like really simple demands. Number three is that we hire Africans, black people to work on the bus in areas where the bus goes in the black community. You know, really simple. You know, it took a year, over a year, of not riding the bus in order for that to happen. And this is for young people out here who think that things are gonna happen right away. Nothing happens fast, it takes time. We need a revolution, but we're going through evolution. We go back and we go forth. So in order to make that happen, the bus strikers back then, 1955, they were organized. They organize, you know, the rides, the job, the or they organize everything. And we have to do that too. We have to be organized. Okay, so now I'm going to read this statement by Mumia. And, and one other thing I'm going to have to say is that we, we don't, we shouldn't be doing this. I mean, I, I went to, uh, they had a few demonstrations here. One was Reclaim Our Community, which was in Southeast San Diego, which was a great event. And one was I Matter, which was put on by the religious community which was also good in front of the police department downtown. But a lot of those demonstrations were saying that we don't want what happens in uh, Ferguson to happen here in San Diego. How do we prevent that? Well, what is it that we don't want in Ferguson to happen in San Diego? I think the police don't want us to get riled up, don't want us to protest, don't want us to express what we to speak out, don't want us to, it's too much. But we have to figure this thing out because eventually, you know, just like in, in San Diego right now, three people have been killed in San Diego in 2014. So we have to figure this thing out. We have to figure out how are we going to, you know, how do we deal with the police, right? We really need an independent 
community elected police review board, and Kyle has explained to you why we need that. Because in every one of these cases, how long it takes to get a, even a report, you know, to the families. So back to Mamiya, he's written, written several um, essays, you know, related to this event, and I just chose one. I just chose one. And the title to this is One, Two, Three Ferguson's. For over a week, the media and millions of viewers and readers have been focused on the ever-changing events of Ferguson, Missouri, where a local teenager, Michael Brown, was shot to death by a white cop. What has been consistent and unchanging has been the level of outrage among black Ferguson residents, men and women who have resisted every attempt to silence or sidetrack their efforts. Their efforts to achieve the arrest, prosecution, and conviction of the white cop, Daryl Wilson, who killed and shot, shot and killed Mike Brown. They are fueled by theory and a long train of police repression. They haven't let anything, promises, provocations, politi politicians, or police turn them away from their objectives. The system has used weapons of war, sniper rifles, armored, un armored personal carriers, submachine guns, and other implements of military violence to intimidate the people, to threaten the people, to silence the people. They only continued their marches for justice for Mike Brown. They faced street talking politicians promising peace, police with dark faces promising protection, preachers praying for placidity, and they kept on marching. They were threatened with arrest if they broke curfew and received the acid rain of tear gas, and they kept on marching. Marching for justice for Mike Brown. A reporter for a national cable outlet asked five teens clad in baseball hats and bright red bandanas to identify themselves. One by one, they announced their names. Mike Brown. They were all Mike Brown. As they marched past fear, they are indeed Mike Brown, as we all. And this is from Mumia Abu Jamal. We got to get up and keep up the fight, people. Free Mumia, free all political prisoners, stop police brutality. Thanks, Ariel. Um, like Ariel, I'm a graduate student at San Diego State. Um, and I, I think a number of other people here are from SDSU as well. If you're from SDSU, please uh, raise a hand or a fist so that we know that. All right, excellent. So, y'all, let's, let's keep in touch after this and keep organizing on campus and, uh, and in the community so that this won't be the last day that we organize together, but, but, but just one of the first, right? Um, so, uh, I'm the organization I'm with, the International Socialist Organization, meets here every Thursday at 6 p.m. in the, the rec center just behind the pool there. Uh, this coming Thursday, we have a meeting called From Ferguson to Revolution. How can we finally defeat racism and oppression? So please come, come and join us there at 6 p.m. this Thursday to discuss, uh, discuss this issue and discuss um, how uh, we can create a world where we don't need to keep coming out uh, to fight these things. Um, I, I want to thank the, the speakers before and everybody else who's uh, uh, come out today to join us. It's really important that we're here. We're here to call attention. Um, to the, uh, the lives that have been stolen by the police in San Diego and all across the country and in fact all across the world because uh, police uh, are an institution that serve the same function all around the world. All around the world police oppress poor and working people. All around the world police are racist. So the police as an institution are racist. And we know this because they single out people of color for stops, arrests, and, uh, and, this, and the criminal justice system um, piles on uh, extraordinary sentences to people of color. This institution is racist, but it's not just racist in and of itself. It also helps to create and promote racism in the broader society. It does that by treating black people and other people of color more harshly. And when, uh, when people see people of color being treated more harshly by the police, um, this, this creates um, uh, uh, 
this creates a negative um, image uh, in uh, in the media and in popular culture. Um, you know, a lot of people want to blame like uh, popular music or something um, for for negative images. I think that the um, daily police harassment of people of color actually creates a negative image and creates uh, and, and and reinforces racism. So we have to ask ourselves, why does this institution exist? Why why are there police? They tell us that they're here to protect life and property, but ask the houseless people who live in this park if the police protect their property. They don't. You know, um, ask Michael Brown if the police protected his life. They didn't. They're here to protect, uh, protect the, the lives and the property, not of ordinary people, but of the 1%. And we can learn this by looking at history. In 1820, between 1825 and 1855 is when the institution known as the police got started. Was this because there was a crime wave in the mid-1800s? No, this is because there were large, defiant crowds. Because the changes in the economy, ordinary working people were gathered together in places like this neighborhood. People had neighborhood rebellions, had strikes, and in the slave states of the United States had slave insurrections. So the ruling class created a repressive institution called the police, which are, which are with us uh, still today, and, and their role in society was to break up and defeat large, defiant crowds. That's why you won't see them helping you, but you will see them standing around here when a bunch of peaceful people get together to talk about the problems in our society. And the last thing I want to say, the last thing I want to say is a big thank you, thank you to the people of Ferguson, because the people of Ferguson uh, boldly stood up against all of the uh, Oh, what's the opposite of an outside agitator? Uh, an outside uh, pacifier? All of the people who came into their community and said, oh, you know, don't worry about it, go home, go back inside, we'll figure it out, you know, just wait to vote for somebody in 2016. The people of Sir Ferguson said, no, we want justice now and we're not going home. We have every, every right to be on the streets. We have every right to resist and rebel against the violence of the police. And because of that, they caught the attention and they inspired not just the country, but the world. There's people all over the world looking to Ferguson as an inspiration for fighting back. So we need to take that inspiration and we need to do what the previous speakers here have said, which is get involved in organizations in your community, on your campus. All of the speakers here are good people to talk to about how to get involved. Um, and the next one that I'm gonna bring up is uh, Kathy from United Against Police Terror. So, as I was introduced, I'm with United Against Police Terror San Diego and also part of Black and Pink San Diego. And what we do is we advocate for LGBTQ identified prisoners and we push for prison abolition. So, as a member of both United Against Police Terror and Black and Pink San Diego, a goal is to end the widespread assault on black and brown life by every stage of law enforcement interactions be it through the school to prison pipeline, in custody and in our communities in the form of curfew sweeps, gang injunctions, racial profiling, during vehicle and pedestrian stops, as well as seeking justice for over 100, 180 lives stolen by law enforcement right here in San Diego County. As we all should be aware, the police have no duty to protect the community. Their goal in society is to reinforce laws and to maintain order. Deployed in the streets wearing camouflage battle dress, uniforms, body armor, helmets, radios, assault weapons, and riding mine-resistant ambush protected vehicles, MRAPs, as well as Bearcat vehicles designed for high-risk deployment while aiming long guns at civilians from a prone position as snipers. The militarized assault does not end with the color of one's skin. Law enforcement agencies not only enforce systemic power relations based on race through racial profiling, race-based policing, and targets community of color, but also target people with disabilities and who are mentally ill. People who are deaf, unable to hear orders, they do not unable to heed orders they do not hear, unable to communicate with authority, 
often are killed or battered by a system that does not take the communication needs into consideration. People who are peer, walk, talk differently are often singled out, accused of being under the influence when police bullies these community members. People with mental health conditions come in contact with police on the streets when the behavior doesn't conform to society's expectations. Or when police are called to respond to medical or psychiatric emergencies with brutal and often deadly force, claiming they felt they were in intimate danger. One in every four interactions with people who are mentally ill are killed. Case in point, Glenn Willis, 47 years old, an African-American male who was acting erratically in his home in Oakland neighborhood. In 2003, when he called 911, the responding officer ignored the neighbor's plea that Glenn, was taken into the, Glenn, Glenn should be taken into the hospital, saying, don't tell me how to do my job. And then supposedly perceiving a threat because Willis had a pocket knife, the cop shot and killed him. They target those who deviate from societal and behavioral norms. Law enforcement also police gender lines, enforce dominant racialized gender norms. Yet the gendered aspects and manifestations of law enforcement violence are often invisible in organizing and advocacy. This is where United Against Police Terror comes in. This must be documented and addressed. According to Policing Gender by the radical feminists of the, of the organization Insight, gender is not a separate discussion from policing and profiling. Said Andrea Ritchie, the director of Streetwise and Safe at a panel on policing and gender. Sometimes police enforcement of gender binary, the notion that there are only two genders, male and female, with specific conduct and appearance mandated for each. Until just a few decades ago, cops used to enforce what they were called as sumptuary laws, which required individuals to wear gender appropriate clothing and subject people to arrest and impersonating another gender. Today, such regulations remain in effect in prisons and are enforced through disciplinary infractions and punitive segregation. People who do not conform to gender norms are perceived by law enforcement officers as disorderly, suspicious, threatening, violent, fraudulent, deceitful, and or, or mentally unstable because of their gender disjuncture and are therefore routinely profiled, harassed, and arbitrarily arrested for vague offenses such as disorderly conduct. They are also su to subject to transphobic and homophobic verbal abuse and punishment in the form of physical violence for failure to comply with prevalent norms of gender identity and expression. This is a call to demand justice for all black and brown lives. They all matter. From Mike Brown, to Glenn Willis, to Duana Johnson, a black transgender woman who back in 2008 was beaten by a police officer while she was held in the Shelby County Criminal Justice Center in Tennessee. Later found dead on the street that year. The organization I'm with is organizing a uh, October 22nd event. It's the national call uh, to remember all of the lives lost from police brutality, law enforcement violence. We ask you, because we want this to be more than an organization, we want this to be a movement. Please come on October 22nd. Support your community. Reiterate your rights. Let the individuals know across the street that you do have a right to film. You do have a right to assert your rights. And I really appreciate you coming out here and supporting these organizations. Thank you. My apologies, I actually have a very special woman I'd like to introduce. Um, activism comes naturally to her, and 
personal is political, and she's an amazing woman, amazing mother, and just an amazing person. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you Shekina Ortega. Hi. Um, thank everybody for being out here. It just means a lot. Um, I'm Shekina Ortega. Some of you guys may know me. I'm, I'm, I'm Victor Ortega's wife. And Victor was killed by the San Diego police officer, Jonathan McCarthy, in 2012. So this means a lot to me when everybody's out here supporting. And um, what happened to Michael Brown and Ferguson was wrong. And in order for there to be a difference, people to make a difference, people have to stand up and make some noise. Because if you don't, because I'm going to tell you personally, the police, they lie. They lie. And I'm telling you guys from my own experience, they lie. So we have to be these people's voices because they're not here. Michael Brown's not here to tell what happened. Victor is not here to tell what happened. I'm here to tell what happened when it comes to Victor. Because I just feel like, and, you know, this is so awesome how people come out here and gather around. But we need to step it up a notch, for real. Because um, this is getting out of hand, out of control. And it's like, these police officers, you guys may not realize they're not, but they work for us. Okay, they're supposed to be out here protecting and serving us. And we can't let them just go by no more. Oh, I felt threatened, so I'm gonna shoot first. When they have a, they have a lot of things on their belt, you guys, that they could use. So I say that it's time for us to do something a little bit different. And okay, <laughs> it's time to do a little bit something different because um, when I sat and watched what happened in Missouri, I was disgusted. Like I've been dealing with this for two years. Now, my husband got killed two years ago, and there's no change. Like, I think now I'm just more realized and aware that it happens every single day. Because before Victor died, I didn't realize the police. You know, they took my trust away from them. I don't trust them at all. And I know what it's like to, you know, trust police and, you know, think they're the good guys. And, and I'm not talking about the good cops either. So don't get me wrong. I'm talking about the ones that take advantage of their job and take, you know, they, the one, you know what I'm, the ones I'm talking about. And they know what the ones I'm talking about too. So I just think that, you know, it's a good thing for everybody to be out here and support each other because we are these people. We are Michael Brown and Victor Ortega and all those other names up there. Because, um, I mean, it's funny how, you know, you have two different sides of everything. Like half of the world is team Michael Brown and the other half is officer, but when you, I'm actually somebody that, that's actually to tell you speak firsthand. I don't know, I wasn't in Missouri, but I guarantee the police lie. I guarantee because they did it with my situation, they lie. Um, and you know, Jonathan McCarthy is still working. He's still out there patrolling and you know, living his life. And I don't know if he has kids or not, but he probably sees them. Victor don't get to see his kids. Our kids is over there playing and they don't have a father anymore. You know, so, and it, it, it just, it bothers me that it's like nobody's not doing anything. You know, we go to the district attorney, you know, you think you trust her that she's going to do a thorough investigation. She doesn't. So, you know, it's, what, what could we do? You know, we have to get out there and do something. And I think we should write letters to the attorney general. Because, um, you know, I just don't want nobody to forget about Victor Ortega. Because that happened right here in San Diego. And this is still going on. And I really need you guys' help. I need your support. I need you guys to make some noise for Victor too. Okay, because what happened to him was wrong. And, 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 um, you know, I, I know what it's like to lose somebody from from the police. And I mean, it's just, it's horrible that I'm even out. I think it's horrible that I'm even out here talking about the police mistreating us. Like, But it is what it is, you guys, and we need to do something about it. So um, don't forget about Michael Brown. Don't forget about Victor Ortega. Don't forget about yourselves, okay? Because don't forget about your family members either. Because when you're out here making noise for about all this stuff going on, you're helping everybody out. My kids out there, because they're going to be older, and, you know, we're helping everybody out. And we need to make a change. And um, hopefully, you know, I, w I don't want to see no violence. But I really want people to get mad. Get mad when a police officer shoots somebody when they're handcuffed or when they're surrendering or, you know, when they're walking away. Get mad about that because if you don't get mad about that, they're not going to get mad about it. And it's going to keep on continuing and keep on continuing if we don't put our foot down. So I'm just asking everybody out here, if just help, support, because it's all it takes. If I can't do it by myself. 
no, we can't. I need everybody's help. They're, they're going to look at me like I'm crazy anyways, you know. So I need everybody out here. And the people that just, if you just, maybe you don't know nobody that lost uh, somebody from police or just you're just mad about what's going on. And that's great. Can we get, like, some letters? I think we need letters. Everybody needs to write letters to these um, agency, the attorney general. They need to investigate Jonathan McCarthy, you guys. He's still out there. He's still patrolling near Mesa area. He's a murderer. He needs to get off the street. You know? And I can't even go over the case. I'm still, or my case is still going on, but um, I am going to say that, you know, um, what I could say is that don't believe everything you hear on the news. Okay? Especially when you're hearing it from the police. Because um, it's not true. And the reason why I can sit here and say that, don't get, don't think that um, she just don't like police. I'm telling you guys this because I experienced it. And it's real. Like, they, they're going to come and say whatever they want to say because Victor's not here. You know, these people up there, those names are not here. And the community just going to think, oh, the police said, but the police is liars, so I need you guys to make some noise for all these victims up there from where we are. Michael Brown, everybody. I can't even name all the probably millions of people, but I just want everybody to know. And Ferguson, everybody all over the world that. Even though I'm only in San Diego, I'm supporting you guys and I'm going to do whatever I have to do to make a change. Because this change, when it affects one of us, it affects all of us. And that's what we need to understand is all of us that are in this fight together. And um, it's been two years, you guys, and I'm tired. Like, I'm I'm, right, I'm tired of every time I turn on the news, somebody get killed unarmed. And I'm even talking about people that were actually shooting back. I'm talking about unarmed people here, you guys. This is ridiculous. And they could come up and say any excuse, oh, I feared for my life. It was, it's ridiculous. So, um, thank you guys, and that's all I have to say. Right now. Hello, everyone. Uh, I just want to thank the organizers for bringing us here today. Uh, this is actually my neighborhood. I walked up and down these streets as a high school student at Hoover High, right down the street. Uh, graduated from there in 1990 and uh, I'm actually a professor at UCSD um, which is a real rare thing for someone from Hoover High School or Lincoln or from places like Barrio Logan to end up teaching our youth at UCSD so I take that very seriously as a responsibility to my neighborhood and neighborhoods like mine and uh, what the sister was just talking about is really real the the personal effect that this but this last instance, this latest instance, and it's hard to keep track, like she said, because you can't turn on the news and, and not hear about another one of our youth being gunned down. And, uh, you know, like the year that Trayvon Martin was murdered and everybody was, you know, really rallying around that, there were 312 other black people that were murdered by police and vigilantes that year. 312 other, 313 recorded murders of black people by police and vigilantes in the year 2012. So I hope everybody, everybody gets a chance to see that the report that Malcolm X Grassroots Movement put out that year um, called Operation Ghetto Storm, um, the, the report on, the, on police terror in our communities. And that's available online. You gotta go take a look at that. And that report was based on the longstanding uh, trajectory of this kind of terrorism against our communities. It's actually based on a document that came out in 1951 called We Charge Genocide that was presented to the United Nations that was an accounting of all the murders of black people that took place in the years right after World War II for about a 10 year period. A black communist named William Patterson put that one out. And you, you look at the trajectory all the way back to slavery because you know, I'm a hip hop fan. I know some of the youth here, some of the not so youth folks that remember KRS-One talked about, you know, about police. You're, per you're put here to protect and serve, but who protects us from you? Right? Or what's the difference between an officer and an overseer, right? The officer is, you know, going around our nation and affecting our youth the same way the, the police, the, the, the overseer affected our youth and terrorized all of our people on the plantation. And the sister talking about Victor Ortega's murder, her spouse's murder, and how it, it's a personal thing when she sees this story. My father was murdered by police in 1979, shot four times in the back, unarmed for a $40 robbery of a convenience store in Oklahoma. My little brother's father was murdered, basically lynched in Mississippi uh, for being a black man in Mississippi, basically. 
So this has affected my family for my entire life. But as I grew and as I studied, I realized that it wasn't just about my family. And while we focus on the high incidence of murder of our youth, black and brown and poor and indigenous youth, we can't forget that even when the good cops are doing their good duty and not killing our youth and just taking them to jail and just locking them up, that that's a form of murder as well. Gloria was talking about that earlier. The prison industrial complex is based on the slavery industrial complex. And it's not, a, it's not hyperbole and it's not metaphor. The 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution delegalized slavery in the United States. But if you read that amendment, and please go home and type it in, it says slavery and, and involuntary servitude are no longer legal except if one is convicted of a crime. So it legalized slavery in the prisons and county jails. And so our people have been dealing with that reality of prison slavery since the passage of that amendment in 1865. Now you have 2.3 million of us. 70% are people of color, 99.9% .9 are poor, <clears throat> locked up in these modern day slave plantations that certain people are making a lot of money off of. And it's not just private prison companies. Even though you have CCA, Corrections Corporation of America, operation, operating the biggest immigrant detention facility in the world, just down here in Otah, right next to the Donovan prison, which, is, which, they're, which they're getting ready to expand by about 900 beds with our tax money. So we've been organizing as a part of the San Diego No More Prisons and Jails Coalition. Uh, the system mentioned SAMI, Students Against Mass Incarceration. Uh, the students up at UCSD um, have gotten gotten wind of what their tax, tax dollars are doing and they realize that they need to be in the community. I'm the faculty advisor for that organization. We're going to have plenty of, plenty of events. We marched with the sisters um, for the, you know, the Trail for Humanity a couple of weeks ago from right in Low Barrio Logan all the way down to the border. We need to connect all these dots. And what all these dots say is that if you want to talk about warfare globally, you don't have to look any far further than the, than the domestic warfare and the occupation of our communities that's happening on a daily basis. Thank you. Hi. My name's Christina Imhoff. I'm with Women Occupy San Diego. There's a, a number of us here today. Okay, there's, okay. there's a number of us here today from Women Occupy San Diego, and I, I think it's great uh, to see so many people out today about this. Um, Women Occupy has uh, a group of us that are working on reforming the Citizens Oversight Board for the police. Uh, as you know, the police are being audited by an outfit called PERF, Police Executive Reform, uh, Review Forum. Um, they were here in San Diego uh, and we held meetings uh, with them. Uh, we held one meeting that was very uh, stirring. People testified about their experiences with the police. We wanted PERF to get as many stories as possible to let them see what people are really experiencing from the police department. Not what the media are saying, but what is actually happening. And we want more of you to tell your stories. It is extremely important for this outfit, PERF, to hear from you. Uh, our long-term goal is to reform the Citizens Oversight Board, uh, to get a new petition on the ballot, actually, and make the board more powerful. Right now, it has no subpoena power. It cannot investigate on its own. It has to take the word of the Internal Affairs Department in a case. Um, it's really the Internal Affairs Department that decides which way a case is going to go. So there's no real independent review. So we want to change that. And we need a ballot uh, measure. We need an initiative. We need to collect petitions. Um, I would ask for your help. Anybody that wants to help us do this, please come and see me. We will sign you up to our group so we can get involved and start this process. Do you all agree? We need reform! Oh my gosh! So Occupy submitted 23 cases of complaints against the police during the Occupy action in City Plaza downtown. We call it Freedom Plaza. Um, 
none of those 23 cases went to the Citizens Oversight Board. And we asked them, where are they? What's the status? We don't know. How's that for professionalism? So we need to change it. Let's change the Citizens Oversight Board review. Thank you. And I have copies of the form to follow your, not officially, these are complaint um, forms or comment forms to the PERF. And I want as many people as possible to fill out these forms. Mrs. Ortega already has done that for me. Please come and get a form and fill out. If you have any experiences of encountering the police here in San Diego, let us know what they are. Write them down. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, I'm Imani. I'm not with any particular organization. Speaking to the mic. Uh, Speaking to the mic. I'm not with any particular organization, but um, so I know many of us have probably never first uh, experienced uh, police brutality firsthand. But as Gloria told me, if it if it takes everybody to be personally victimized to believe that there's something wrong with the system, then we're already too late at that point. Um, in a social contract, we have the people and we have the state. And the fact that, that the police have more power than us, that they have authority over us, uh, means that they also have accountability. You can't have, you can't have a title without, um, without having an answer for, for your mistakes and for your crimes. And, and so as the people, our power is in numbers. So we must use our numbers and we must use our voices if we're actually ever going to make anything happen. Or else, uh, or else the, 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 these issues will continue. Um, if, if police continue, uh, so my grandfather, um, when he was picking up uh, my, when he, he was like in his 50s, uh, he was picking up my uncle, uh, he was driving down the road, this is in Palo Alto, and a police officer stopped him, started talking to my uncle and, and harassing him. My, my grandfather got out of the car to try to explain the situation that it was his son. And then uh, the police officer claimed at that point that he grabbed for his gun and, uh, and was attempting to assault him. And he, he threw him on the ground, he handcuffed him, he beat him. And then he went to jail for, for two months. And then he was, uh, and he, this is a Stanford alumni, father of three, um, who, who was treated in, in this way. And when he, he got out of jail, he had a congestional heart problem that, that ended up killing him a few, uh, a few years later. And um, I think the fact that this happened, and it's not, that not just an instance, but, but a, a pattern is completely unacceptable. Um, and, and so, just when we when we look at Ferguson and we look at, at San Diego, um, you know, we, we just want justice. And the only thing that's getting in the way of that is is uh, is this sort of power power construct we have, and we need to rise above it. We've been em empowering our police as a country through the military industrial complex, through through the war on drugs, and through through the war on terrorism. We've given police officers these guns and turned them against you know the, the citizens and, and made, made them think that this is their own sort of war zone and that they have things that, that, that we're the enemy but um, but that's not the case and the police should be working for us and if they don't they, they, they don't have the right to, to be in charge to have authority over over the people the accountability is necessary if, 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 uh, if police are, are to do their job Hello, uh, my name is Virginia Franco, and I am the local contact for the Democratic Socialists of America, San Diego. Um, I have a statement here from our national website, uh, which is very long, so I will shorten it because there are so many human interest stories that people want to listen to. Uh, DSA is a national organization out of uh, New York City, where we have several youth section chapters. Here in San Diego, we don't have a youth section chapter. The organization is at www.dsausa.org in the event you want to uh, read for yourself the whole text of this uh, statement. I chose just a few. Uh, okay, justice for Michael Brown, community control of police and equality for all. Statement by the Democratic Socialists of America National Political Committee, August 21st. 2014. Democratic Socialists of America calls for a full federal rights investigation into the killings of Michael Brown and an end to the militarization of local police forces. 
The action of the Ferguson, Missouri Police Department exemplifies the dangers to the lives of ordinary Americans, particularly people of color, posed by overly aggressive, heavily armed police forces. And I will scroll down to, at play in Ferguson are forces long present in American society. The unrelenting killing of unarmed young persons of color by both police forces and white vigilantes. From Trayvon Martin to Oscar Grant or Eric Garner demonstrates how racism literally takes the lives of people of color. I was here before you uh, people who came for the Trayvon Martin Memorial also, and it, I can't believe I'm still here. While urban rebellion is a, in oppressed communities of color are by no means a new phenomenon for the United States, the level of paramilitary police force in Ferguson is. The tanks battle, armor, and mounted semi-automatic weapons present in the streets reflects Americans' imperial ambitions abroad as these weapons are channeled from surplus war equipment to local police departments through the Department of Homeland Security grants. As democratic socialists, we abhor the logic that allows for local police departments to transform themselves into surrogate occupying armies defending social order against popular demands for social justice. DSA believes DSA believes in fighting for an equitable tax system that would fund public investment and job training that could employ the underemployed and unemployed in alternative energy production and rebuilding of infrastructure and affordable housing. In addition, independent civilian review boards with adequate funding and power should oversee a local police force that is well trained and representative of the communities they serve. And I am proud to say I'm also a member of the Women Occupy San Diego and the and the efforts, uh, their efforts are uh, incredible and, and incredible too. Uh, that's the end of my talk except for this last paragraph. Such measures can only mitigate, not abolish the effects of racist criminal justice policies and the absence of equality of opportunity for low-income Americans. The events in Ferguson demonstrate that activity challenging how law enforcement affects poor communities must be a priority for a working to build a better America. Changes in criminal justice policies, however, cannot be themselves, by themselves, bring justice for all Americans. Social protest movements such as this one today must demand government policies that serve the interests of all rather than those in a narrow elite. Only by building a majoritarian movement for racial and economic justice can we reserve, reverse the growth of racial and class apartheid in the United States. Thank you for listening. How's everybody doing today? Are you ready to march soon? All right, <laughs> All right I'm going to keep this short. As our nation mourns the death of another black youth, we are reminded once again of the injustices that occur every day due to police brutality. We are also reminded that our society is far from being anywhere near a post-race era. Not when youth are already deemed as criminals for simply having black or brown skin. Not when our system doesn't do enough to help protect people of color from racial profiling and police abuse. Not when at least half the nation is willing to turn a blind eye to the state-sanctioned violence inflicted onto marginalized communities by an increasingly mil militarized police force. Many people have criticized the people of Ferguson for inciting violence. But what about the violence committed by police officers every day? Over the years, there has been a consistent pattern of police officers inflicting violence onto citizens, most of them being men of color, the LGBT community, and women. While the nation has paid close attention to the issue of men of color being targeted, victimized, and murdered by police, there has been a silence when it comes to acknowledging the stories of women who are also victims of state-sanctioned violence. A firm calls on justice for those whose voices are silenced into submission and whose stories never reach the news. A firm calls on the names of Yvette Smith, a 47-year-old woman killed in Texas by a sheriff's deputy. 
Ayana Jones, a seven-year-old girl from Detroit who was killed in her own home due to a single bullet shot by a Detroit SWAT officer. And the list goes on. The women of a firm denounce the current injustices at play here. We continue to denounce imperialism, militarization of police and borders, and the marginalization of our communities. And as a transnational feminist organization, we recognize the connections of these injustices as they relate to communities across the nation and across the globe. From Ferguson to Gaza to San Diego, although our struggles are different in many ways, our communities are fighting against the same enemies, the same forces that are constantly working against us. We continue to denounce the state-sanctioned violence that has harmed and murdered countless numbers of women and children. We matter. Women matter. And until justice is served, we will continue to fight in solidarity against these forces that fuel our oppression and threaten our very lives. All right, is everybody ready to march now? All right. I can't hear you. Is everybody ready to march? All right, I'm going to give the mic to Ariel, who's going to direct you. Hey everyone, as she said, we're about to march, so yeah, start walking in that direction. Same enemy, same fight. You all are my heroes today because you're out here on Labor Day celebrating Labor Day the way it should be celebrated, as a working people's day of resistance. Not a vacation day, but a commemoration of the struggles of those who came before us and put up a resistance to the corporate capitalist machine that is playing the same games with us today. The system is not just targeting some odd people on the streets, but they are targeting all of us. As our sign says in the back, if it shoots to kill like a police state, if it spies on you like a police state, if it represses activists and whistleblowers like a police state, what do you think we have? With the growing inequality, both racial and economic and gender, they know there's going to be resistance because where there is repression, there is resistance. And they are building a militarized force to suppress, rather than to solve the economic problems, they would like to repress this. So we are on the point of the spear and need to be more organized and need to bring 10 people with us next time. I encourage you to join an organization. There are many here, many organizations, the Committee Against Police Brutality, the sister who just uh, spoke, activists San Diego, ISO and others. We need people. Affirm. Join something. Be part of it. Be part of the movement. Be a leader, not a follower. We'll leave it at that. Let's march. <laughs> They're watching us on a daily basis. You know, we're watching you now. <laughs> the salute. All right, you guys, let's march. Um, if you didn't get the chance to speak, we'll have an open mic after the march if you still want to come up and speak, so. For justice. No peace. No killer. No peace. No justice. No peace. No killer. Police. 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 No justice. No peace.
Pide Vare, el pueblo unido, jamás será vencido. Is that better? Um, I, I want to talk to you about a personal experience with police brutality to fill in some of the details of what actually happened. Um, I grew up. Yes. Okay. I grew up in a Blue Collar neighborhood on the East Coast, and it was the cops versus the kids, just like it is everywhere else. I was a good runner in those days. Um, and uh, I, I, I discovered what it was all about when I was still uh, a teenager, 17. Um, I, uh, I got drunk, I was driving a car, I got stopped uh, by the police in the city, and I took off. There were 11 shots in my car, and not in me. Um, by the way, I haven't, I have never spoken about this publicly, but I get, it would just, it has to get out. When, uh, when they finally got me, um, there was a war between a, 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 a person my size and four cops. Um, Two of them said that I, I caused them to go to the hospital, which really shows you how cops lie, unless it was for broken bones in their hands. I, uh, I'm looking at that experience with new eyes. If they had had automatic weapons, I would not be here. If I were African American, I would not be here. Uh, I never knew that surviving a shooting, being savagely beaten, being tortured in the station house subsequently, and then of course legal proceedings that I won't go into, I never thought of that as white privilege. Now I do. It left me with PTSD that lasted for years. When I ever I saw a cop, there were times if I had had a weapon, it would have been a dead me or a dead cop. That's one thing that comes out of police brutality. They make enemies for life, and they create a threat against their own lives. I'm not the only person in the world who responded that way. I was half nuts for years, and then I joined the movement. And it, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, 
the feminist movement. The, the working against Prop 8. I've been in all of them. And the sisters and brothers in those political movements healed me. I, they got me to understand the problem wasn't me, the problem was the system and how it functions. Forty some odd years ago in this city, when we saw a, an arrest being made by the police, we'd observed. We had no cameras, nothing like that, but we wanted to be ready to testify if anything untoward happened to the person being arrested. If it was an African-American person, you were even more motivated because you knew what they were probably in for at the hands of the police. Now we've got cell phones and we've got sexy cameras and all of that. We can at least watch whenever the police are interrogating and arresting. We can, we can shoot film, we can shoot our, our video. We gotta do that. If you got a camera, shoot the video. And I have personally committed, if I see any, anything going on where somebody's getting the crap beat out of them, I am going to intervene. And I know what the consequences of that are. But we can't, we just can't stand around and let the cops brutalize us. So, that's about all, that's about all I have to say. Uh, there's a lot of more personal details, but... Uh, I'm just glad to be alive. I'm glad I'm not on a list like that. And I'm sure I would have been if I were black and not white. Thank you. Hands up! Don't shoot! Hands up! Don't shoot! All right, we got Marco coming up next. Are we tired? No. 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 Good, because we don't got the privilege to be tired. We don't got the privilege to be cansados, right? Um, this this goes said at every march, I feel like, at every protest, at every single type of thing, right? This can't end here. We hear that all the time, right? This can't end here, right? Well, now, in this case, now in today's day and age, in our era, right now, it cannot not only not end here, right? It can't only just stay at this level, right? It has to not only not end here, it has to grow. It has to be something huge. Like this, it's not just a police fucking state. You know, it's not just that. It's our institutionalized racist system, right? It's our patriarchal sexist system, right? It's our white privileged system, right? That we have a system that was found, founded upon slavery and genocide. That is the system in which we are living in, right? That, all that we can change. You know what I mean? Like, like, it, it just fixing the cops isn't going to change the, our, our problems, right? The cops, but like, that's not the only problem we have, you know what I mean? And, and, it's, and it's much larger than this. Um, I, I'm not going to say that much. Uh, I bet there's other people here that, that really want to speak and, and can say a lot of, a lot of things. Um, I, I know lots of, uh, lots of uh, my, my fellow Chicanas and Chicanos um, couldn't be here today because uh, the Chicano Chicana moratorium is going on right now in Los Angeles. Um, and so if, if, I know if, if, if that wasn't going on, like, I, I know there'd be also like a lot, a lot, a lot of brown representation here as well. Um, I unfortunately couldn't go, but I'm damn sure I'm happy I'm here. <clears throat> um, I, I want to end. I want to end my my personal spiel um, with with the with the famous you know uh, activist quote by Sada Shakur, um, ex Black Panther uh, political refugee. <clears throat> if y'all can please repeat after me every single time a little bit louder. <clears throat> it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect each other. We must love and protect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect each other. We must love and protect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. 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 It is our duty to win
It is our duty to win. We must love and protect each other. We must love and protect each other. We got nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you. Um, just come and find me, but next person we have right now is Erica Jane. Woo! So, how's everyone doing tonight, today? Is everybody else mad like me about what's happening? I can't hear you! Louder! So, after, after what happened to Michael Brown and and the uprising Ferguson started, and the Bay Police crackdown start started. I was I was mad. And I was angry about what happened because we've had this system of white supremacy in our country for hundreds, literally hundreds and hundreds of years. There was a study that I saw that on current trends, how long it would take for Black folks to, to get equality, and based on current trends, it the the year they predicted was. 2,432. I, I don't think any of us want to wait another 400 years. Do you want to wait 400 years? No! So, I, I'm a spoken word poet, and the way that I see it is that as an artist, I can't be silent about what's happening, about what's happening in the world. So, I wrote a poem. Growing up, I was told anti-black racism was over, only a horror that was confined to the past. After all, Lincoln freed the slaves down to the last. Lyndon B. Johnson passed the Civil Rights Bill with only his white goodwill, ending a century of Jim Crow using the mighty power of Capitol Hill, helping black folks up and now all was right with the earth. Echoes proclaiming a post-racist rebirth. I later learned People in charge like to lie. Legacies of distorting the victims of dissidents who fought against the bad guy. If you can't judge someone by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, then our post-racist society will equate the color of their skin with the content of their character. Put it more towards your mouth, sorry. Okay. Wait. Oh, yeah, it's working now. And they will equate the color of their skin with the content of their character. Black youth becoming criminalized but just having a childhood. Hoodies and skittles, it doesn't take much for police and vigilantes to inflict the killing touch. Time and again, it happens too much. When black women and men are murdered by white supremacy, racism is not over when black folks are still trapped in the new confederacy. Yeah. Michael Brown was one of the latest. A youth with a bright future ahead, just about to go to college. Unprovoked, the officer shot to kill. One bullet to bleed, a second to cause surrender, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth to execute, a sixth, a seventh, an eighth, a ninth, and a tenth to show what happens to those under the police boot. When they left his body for four hours, Retrieving him, not with an armored car. Retrieving him, not with an ambulance, but an armored car. And I dare...